you could please turn again with me to Ephesians chapter 6. As I said before, last time I was here, we looked at verse 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. And we saw then that we are in a spiritual battle. If we are Christians, there is a spiritual battle that is much broader than what we see going on in the world and what we hear on the news. There's a battle going on behind the news that they don't even mention, but it's taking place and it is ongoing. At the, behind every news story, even though God is never mentioned, God is working. He is sovereign, sovereign over all things. He is still on the throne. We're told in Psalm 103, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. So he is ruling over this world with all its problems, with all its turmoil. But we have an adversary who is working who throws a veil over the gospel. We learned last time that that person is the devil, Satan. We're told that he blinds men's and women's hearts, their minds. We're told, lest the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon, shine on them. That's his activity in the world. So we're in this battle. It's not fought with physical guns or swords or anything like that. But it's a spiritual battle. And he writes about six items that we should put on. And of course these are talking of spiritual things. And those items are listed here in this chapter. The one is the belt of truth. Two is the breastplate of righteousness. And then we're told to put on shoes of the gospel of peace. And then we're told to take up a shield of faith, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. And this evening I want us to look at the first item, which is the belt of truth. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. It helps us to stand. And that word gird, there in that verse, it means to belt up, put on that belt. I remember a time when uh, uh, seat belts were not compulsory, and there was they changed the law, and nowadays you have to put on a seat belt. And uh, I think there was a an advertising campaign at the time. I think this is going back to the early 90s. <laughs> And it, they said, clunk, click, every trip, put on your belt. And they show some statistics of how many people died of, you know, from, from not wearing a seat belt. So this wearing this belt of truth is something very important for us to do. So we'll look at what we wear. The tr we wear the truth. And then we'll look at, well, what, what truth? What is the truth? And then thirdly, we'll, we'll, we'll see how do we know the truth? So in the first place, we see this first piece. It's very important. It's the first item mentioned on Paul's list. So obviously, it's very important for us. And these are... Um, these, uh, this armor, they're not just adornments. We don't just put them on for show, like 
some fashion items that people put on and it just doesn't really have any purpose. But we just put it on. I sometimes wonder why why do we wear ties? <laughs> it doesn't really have any purpose in itself, but it just it just looks nice, I suppose. Looks looks good. But these things have a purpose. We wear the belt of truth. This belt it keeps everything close to us, doesn't it? It keeps everything together. And in Paul's day, he was talking about the long flowing robes that people wore at that time. And a belt would keep it all together. It binds all, all, all of it together. And the truth is like that. The truth is consistent. It binds together many things. First of all, it, yes, as I said, it's consistent. Imagine a police officer is investigating a crime and they interview several of the witnesses and they're trying to piece all the things together, what happened at that crime scene. I suppose some, some say, well, the mo most of them, five or six people, they all have exactly the same account of what happened. And then one comes along and says, oh, hang on, they're saying something completely different. And this is how the police do their investigations, isn't it? How they establish the truth. And if someone says something that doesn't go against, but, but goes against the established facts, we have a very good indication that, oh, well, maybe they're telling a lie. And the word of God, the truth, the truth is always consistent. It never contradicts itself. It always adds up. You may remember your maths from when you were little. If you made a mistake anywhere in your calculations, you got the wrong answer. And that's always what happened for me. I, somewhere I'd make a mistake. Um, perhaps accountancy wasn't my thing. <laughs> I'd always make a mistake somewhere. You see all those columns of numbers, they all have to add up. And the, the word of God, it all hangs together. It all adds up. And many people try and point out inconsistencies in the Bible. Well, all of them can be answered. And if, if that's something that is um, something that you're concerned about, oh, maybe I found an inconsistency. Well, talk to me afterwards and we'll... There's so many resources that I can point to you, point you to, that show that the, the word of God is consistent. It's because it's true. It's inerrant. And that's a very important thing in our time today. Because so many people are saying that the word of God is, well, there's some bits that aren't really true. And if we allow that, then, well, if that's not true, what about this? And if that's not true, what about this? And then all of a sudden, everything unravels, doesn't it? That we as, as Christians, we affirm and assert that the Bible is true. It is inerrant. Why? Because it's God's word. Why? God would not give us an inerrant word. And if there is something that we question, and it's good to question, we do find that with, with investigation and research and looking into it, we do find that the Bible does turn out to be true. In the field of archaeology, for instance, some 
have found certain things in, in the ground. Oh, because of this, the Bible's not true. And then someone comes along and says, hang on, we found this, which means it is. <laughs> and that's, the, that's what happens consistently over the ages. The Bible is seen and shown to be true. And the truth always comes out eventually, doesn't it? We have an expression, don't we? The truth will out. And it does. Not all the time. Not so Sometimes it takes a long time for the truth to come out. We think of those people who were involved in the... Um, that football ground at uh, Hillsborough many years ago. Initially, the certain group of people were accused of, of being hooligans. And then over the years, some of the, pa- the parents of those who died, they came together, and eventually the truth came out. And we know that this book, this Bible, is true. And it will stand forever. The truth stands forever. His word will be vindicated, shown to be true. It will always be true. My grandma had a very interesting expression that she would uh, share with us on occasion. She said to to me, urging me not, not, not to lie about things. Why? Because she said, Well, liars have to have a good memory. And that's true, isn't it? Trying to remember all the lies that you've told, it's difficult. But if you tell the truth, that's easy. You can remember that. You see, lies can and do unravel. And if... You are a believer here this evening. I urge you to gird your waist with truth, with the word of God. The Bible not only claims to be true, it also claims that its author is truth. We see that in John, John's Gospel. We see right at the beginning that he, the word of God, the logos in the Greek, that's referring to the word. Jesus Christ was the word. The word was with God, and the word was with God. The word was God. And then Jesus said of himself, I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He not only speaks truth, he is the truth. What can you say? Can you say that of anything else? No. His truth brings, we're told, light. And that was one of the very, well, the very first thing that we read in the Bible. Let there be light. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not work in, walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And that light of life, it speaks of God's truth. It speaks of understanding. It speaks of knowledge of God. Psalm 119 says, The entrance of your words gives light, it gives understanding to the the simple, the truth. And if you have the truth on your side, then you are strong. And that's why Paul is urging the Ephesians to take up and gird themselves with truth. Because if you have the truth on your side, you're strong. And you can build your life on that truth. 
The truth is like a, a solid rock on which we can build. And again, the Lord Jesus told a parable about this very thing. What do we build our lives on? Do we build on rock, solid rock, or do we build it on sand? He says in Matthew chapter 7, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, the truth that he's telling them, and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended. The floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. Building on a rock gives you a strong house. And I hope you're beginning to see this evening how strong this truth is if we gird ourselves with it. This truth gives the Christian a strength the world does not understand. And this truth has done remarkable things throughout all of history. It's been at the very center of every revival that has ever happened. We can think of the Welsh revival in the early part of the last century. What happened? It was the truth coming to a people, and it changed them completely. Gird yourself with truth. Well, secondly, what is what is the truth that we're told to put on, to wear? We've seen that the, Jesus Christ is the truth. But what is the truth? This is a question that Pilate, Pontius Pilate, actually asked the Lord Jesus. Jesus appeared before him, before his crucifixion, and Jesus said, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So there's the truth again. But then what does Pontius Pilate say? His response is, wow, what is truth? And that statement by Pilate is very much the statement of the world today. You see, the world does not know what truth is. Even the very idea that there is a truth, an objective truth, is questioned today. Even things that we would see as obviously true are questioned. I'll give you an example. How, I think the BBC have just published a list of how many genders there are. And I think it runs into the, the tens even going up to 50, 60. The truth is that the, what we see in the Bible, in the very first chapter of, of chapters of Genesis, God made them male and female. There's the truth. And then we have the whole of the scriptures, which is called a deposit of truth, a deposit of faith that we must hold fast to. Hold fast the pattern of sound words, he writes to, the, to, to Timothy. 
which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. The good things which, are, which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. The pattern of sound words, that's what we get from the, from the, from the scriptures. And we're told to preach the whole counsel of God's word. Again, in Acts 20, we're told, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God, of God. And this morning, we looked a little bit about, and we looked at that oath that people say in the, in the courts. I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And here, Paul is telling them to declare the whole counsel of God. And that's so very important. Because there is a danger that we can have a very lopsided ministry. I trust that in this church we, we hear from all parts of the scripture, not just maybe the preacher's favorite verses, you see, many of the cults, they, they just dwell on certain parts which are true in themselves, but they just want to dwell in, on certain things and not the whole counsel of God. And at the same time, they can very subtly introduce errors which can be deadly. So we must... Preach the whole counsel of God. And that's what Paul tells us to do. And Jesus tells us, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And this truth is about what he came to do in this world. He said that we can be free from all our efforts and dead works, all those efforts that we do to make ourselves right with God. He says that all our best works are like filthy rags in his, in his sight. So abandon them and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is at the cross that he paid for our sins. He died for our sins, all of them. Not one is left out. And if you are a believer here this evening, then all of your sins have been put to his account. And I want to ask you, have your sins been put to his account? Because if they haven't, then that punishment that was poured out on Jesus, that will be poured out on you. So I urge you, flee and go to Christ. Repent of your sins and put your faith in him. And all those sins that you've done will be laid on him. He gives you his righteousness. And here's the wonderful news, the gospel that sets us free the truth will make you free. And it's this very gospel that Paul and the disciples of Jesus went out and proclaimed throughout Judea and then further afield into Turkey, into Greece, and eventually into Rome. And many be Many became believers. And that message has gone out throughout the whole world since. And we see how many Christians there are in the world now. That's the power of this truth. And I was listening to, Lloyd, to Martin Lloyd-Jones on these verses written here. And I believe he said, he said something very important which I want to share with you. 
He was talking about how this truth is proclaimed. There are many who think the scriptures need to be helped along, he said. They don't believe it is enough to just proclaim the words of the Bible alone. But you have to appeal to man's will, he said, as though man is at the center of everything. And God is coming along and asking politely for our worship. Well, some churches have gone down that route, haven't they? They, perhaps the Bible is, is, is quoted, but over a while, less and less of it is publicly proclaimed. And they appeal more to the emotions and and our, our, our felt needs. And some use clever words and, and um, eloquent speech and, and emotional manipulation. But we don't do that. We stick to these words written here because they're powerful. They don't need any help. It's this word is is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Paul said, we proclaim the word of God and trust in in the power of God to salvation. And we don't just come here also to hear just, just interesting things. We're not here, I hope, that to just fill our heads with head knowledge. It is possible, as we're told earlier in this book, in Ephesians 3, to always be learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. It's possible to know things, but not really know the person behind these words, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. When Peter preached his sermon, his word, the words that he quoted from the scriptures always had an, a, a deep impact on people. And that's what we hope will happen when the, this book is, is, is preached on. It says in Acts chapter 2, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, What shall we do? You see, the words had an effect. Instead of just saying, well, oh, that was quite interesting, and then talk about something that they'd done the other day, no, they were cut to the heart. It affected them deeply. That's the effect of the truth this gospel, that Christ came into the world to save sinners. And then thirdly, how do we gird ourselves with truth? How do we come to to a knowledge of this truth? Well, it's by reading the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Do we read our Bibles? Do we read the scriptures? You see, it's very easy to to leave it aside and then other ideas start to creep in. We're told again in Ephesians chapter 4 of those who are tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. But if we keep our minds soaked in Scripture, then that won't happen to us, will it? Because there's a lot of deception going on in the world today. And we've got to know our scriptures. We can very easily be taken in. We're told again in Ephesians chapter 4, 
taken in by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So it's very important that we read the Scriptures and that we grow up in all things and into him who is the head, Christ. Reading the Scriptures, but also coming before Jesus Christ in prayer. Coming into his presence. Drawing close to Christ. So here we have the truth. And we also have the blessing that it is the Holy Spirit that teaches us this truth. When Jesus was here in his earthly ministry, he could tell his disciples himself the truth. But he was going to go away. But he promised to send them a helper. He says, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And how thankful we are for the Holy Spirit that he dwells in the believer and that he does guide us into the truth. If there's some subject that we struggle with, then we can come before him in prayer. And we rejoice that Jesus Christ is teaching us today through the Holy Spirit. We pray that God would show us the truth. Colossians 1 verse 9 says, We have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So we pray for others, that they would know the truth. We pray that you would know the truth here in Bedworth. Do we just accept what we're told? You know, we, we do listen to much preaching. And you're listening to me here now, this evening. Is what I'm saying the truth? Well, I pray and hope that these things I'm saying are from the Scriptures. But please, look into these things yourself. Because sometimes people come along and they want to twist the truth. And Acts chapter 17 verse 11 tells us about Christians who... They searched the scriptures daily. It says these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. And they, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They searched the scriptures daily. Well, I'm sure... We all have our own personal plan of Bible reading. And I'm sure we can all do maybe a bit, do better than we are doing at the the moment. If there's a a few moments that you can, you've got free, just open the Bible and start reading. We live in an age of so much falsehood. And we need to gird ourselves with the belt of truth. So, this evening, we've looked at this verse. We've looked at what we gird ourselves with. We've looked at what the truth is. And how that we can know that truth? By reading the words of the Bible. And I hope you see that there is much strength in girding ourselves with truth. Have confidence in that truth. And this is, we've looked at just one item 
and spiritual armor. There's still five more that we can look at. And they'll give us more strength and even more strength in these times. God willing, we'll be looking at those next time. Well, let's pray. Let's come before God and pray.